Hello, welcome everybody. Today I want to talk about automated testing for embedded development and how we at Pingotronics are planning our next generation of board farming. Um, just for a beginning, um, what is Pingotronics? Who is Pingotronics? Uh, we are around 30 colleagues based in northern Germany and we are an embedded Linux consultancy and service provider. Um, and we do everything from integration into uh, your uh, embedded Linux environment up to graphics uh, driver development and stuff like that. And yeah, because we are kind of versatile in what we do, we've got customers in, in all industries uh, that basically use embedded Linux. Um, and for the 5.14 uh, merge into the Linux kernel, we even made an it to the LWN statistics with uh, just 1% of change, set, change sets, but hey, we're still on the first page. Um, about me, I'm Chris. I'm senior hardware developer, so I didn't contribute a single patch to the statistics on the last slide. But my team and I do embedded Linux um, remote control hardware development. So. Um, we have got the feeling that we often need devices that we can't buy and so well, we started to develop our own a few years ago and so i'm not that on the software side but i'm more on the hardware side and that's basically the reason why my talk is more about hardware today i guess um, why do we need to talk about bot farming uh, i mean uh, if i could possibly ask a lot of people in this room and they would tell me at least uh, a few uh, standard bot farming software sets that, that they know or even use, like uh, Fuego, uh, where Tim Bird is really active, Lava um, or LabGrid, where we spawn a lot of development. And there is even a lot of more um, software available for bot farming. Uh, uh, Tim Bird's Linux Org has a, a good list of software if you want to take a look there. and. Additionally to that, uh, it's mostly the same uh, on the hardware side. We have had talks from Bay Libre uh, about their lab or lab in a box. Um, they are doing also a hardware development for embedded Linux remote controlling. Um, we have uh, seen uh, Pavel Smooks Pi here at ELC uh, and their devices like the 3 m Dab RTE, if you want remote control and devices. And I guess most of us who already do board farming have their own in-house solution uh, for board farming and remote controlling. Um, so why do we need to talk about it? Well, because I think there isn't a one-fits-all solution and we are all just doing the next step while we're on it. So I think it's really important to talk to each other uh, and see what the other people are doing, what problem they are solving and what, what issues they had on the way. Um, so, my topic for today, I will start with uh, a short uh, primer. I want to talk about uh, what is bot farming and why you may want to do it. Um, then I will present Pangotronic's current solution for bot farming uh, and talk about what is good and what is bad uh, with that solution. And then I want to talk about what we're trying to do next or just on our next generation of board farming. And I hope in the end, there will be a few minutes, minutes time for discussion. Okay, short primer to bring this up to the same velocity. What do you need to control an embedded Linux device? Most basic thing is you will probably need a power supply and some kind of power source, but another battery and a serial interface. That can be RS-232 or UART, that can, may even be tunneled via USB, but a serial terminal is, uh, is really important. You need to talk to your bootloader, you need to talk to your Linux. Um, additionally, you may need some GPOs because you uh, want to switch boot modes, for example, or assert the global reset on your device, um, or USB for serial download of new images. Um, to uh, yeah, use IMX uh, Fastboot, uh, Android, uh, things like that, Android Fastboot, IMX USB loader, things like that. And depending on your 
um, on your use case, on the use case of your device, you may have some other interfaces. You may need to uh, interface with an SD card, you have an Ethernet port for connectivity, CAN buses if you're doing automotive or automation, um, HDMI, DSI or camera interfaces if you're doing graphics, uh, input or output, you may have an audio input or output or some LEDs to, to show your current state. And I think most of us developers tend to be a little bit of lazy. So if we have to repeat steps over and over, we tend to automate them and to find a way to well, not do these all small steps again because it introduces errors and isn't that interesting. And at some point, you will not just write a small script that does stuff, but you will also introduce some hardware that allows you to, for example, remotely switch the power supply um, uh, or remotely switch NGPO. And if you do that and you don't have only one board on your desk, but one, two or three, then I think you can already call that board farming because you're doing the, the most important thing, you're remote controlling your hardware. Um, so bot farming, the most important thing is you need to remotely control your devices. You need to have automated control of their state. And once you have that and you don't need to manually interact with them, you can start to work uh, remotely. You don't need to be in your office to control your device. And you can even share your bots with colleagues somewhere else. Um, um, yeah, next step is just uh, running tests because, well, once you're there and you have remote control, why not automate your testing and not do all the same steps again and again? And, well, when you're there and have, you have written your tests, you can also integrate those with your continuous integration that you may already have, and then it's continuous testing. And once you're there, it's just full-scale bot farming. So I would say bot farming is an important foundation for quality assurance uh, for software development on real hardware. And I would add it's even an important foundation for uh, efficient and fast development of software on real hardware. We of, at Pengotronics have two main use cases for bot farming. One is the interactive use case where a developer wants to work on a software component, but needs to do that on real hardware. So he's changing some configuration on a build server, on, on, on the source code in the configuration, uh, baking out a new image or a new, root, new, uh, or a new root file system, and then he's trying it out on real hardware. And that is done uh, via automation that's built into our board farm. Um, the other thing he may does is develop a test suite um, for those customers where we have a test suite uh, or where we have agreed to have a test suite. Um, yeah, that's done interactively. And when the test suite is ready, you can start to automatically, automatically run these test suites uh, by CI. And um, that's what we do in the automated use case. We take our test suites and let them be executed by our continuous integration without any human interaction. Um, I would say the interactive use case is the more important one, and it's the one that we do most because we are usually working on a project basis and not all our customer projects have automated testing attached to them, but all projects have some real hardware in our labs that we then use to develop software on it. How does such a lab look like? Um, this is a, a newer one, one of those we have have built during our home office uh, peak time during the pandemic. Um, it's a 19-inch 19, 19 wide server rack just without the walls. And we have eight levels where we can put our devices on the tests, where each level has two slots for, for two devices on the test. And, that is some common infrastructure that all these slots share directly attached to these racks. So these racks just connect uh, with Ethernet to our lab network and wire a uh, main socket to, to the power supply, and that's it. Uh, and we've put them on wheels, so you are free to move them around, not in your whole office, but at least uh, you can just turn them around to get bad access on the back side, for example. So what's all the hardware that is in such a lab? Um, 
First of all, uh, common infrastructure we usually have, there is a power switch in every lab or sometimes two with a lower port count. Um, and if you take a look here, the power switch is hidden behind this this, infra this, this structure here, superstructure here, but there are all these power cables coming out of it. So that power switch is hidden, hidden behind the rack. 24-port um, power switch in the newer ones because we want to have some spare sockets um, in cases where we want to, for example, switch infrastructure on or off or where, where a device on a test needs more than one socket. That happens from time to time. Um, we are using a 24-port Ethernet switch there. Those are PoE in the newer labs, gigabit only. Um, and an RS232 serial server in the older racks, and yeah, that's missing in, in this newer one here. So we can attach up to 16 RS232 serial ports onto the network and then use those remotely. Um, yeah, the power switch is also attached to the Ethernet. Forgot to mention that, so we can also remotely switch the power power outlets there. Um, the other thing in every lab is a test server. That is a fanless device, uh, X64, uh, one uh, eight units big. And we use that for two things mainly. One is we use it to attach all the USB devices we have in uh, every lab, in every rack. And then use it to run the software that wants to attach the USB devices. Um, what USB devices do we attach? Well, first of all, in the newer labs, there is no serial server, so a lot of serial ports uh, for uh, UART on the one hand or RS232 on the other hand. Um, but we also have logic analyzers in our labs. We have uh, USB device ports on our devices on the tests that we use for iMix USB loader or Android Fastboot in the bootloader. And so, yeah, there's a lot of USB devices that, that sum up in the end. More on that a little later. Um, in the older labs, we attached CAN buses via USB. Uh, in the newer labs, that has moved to a, PCI, a mini PCIe card that is directly built into the server. So one USB device, device less. Uh, and our GPIOs have been provided by one wire uh, boards that are connected to a one-way bus. That's an additional bus in our racks. And these one-way buses are connected to the test server by USB. Uh, in the newer um, labs, uh, we start to move away from, from one wire, but a little more on that later. Um, one more thing we have there um, is a Wi-Fi access point. That's just a uh, consumer TP-Link device flashed with OpenWRT. Uh, we use that to provide a well-known uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi access point where our devices under test can connect to. And we also have a Bluetooth stick, stick uh, in the USB port of these access points. So we have a known Bluetooth beacon where our devices under test can, can scan for. Okay, so what, so far with theory about how a labs should look like. Um, this is a photo of a real lab or photos of a real lab uh, that has been in use for about two years uh, before I took this photo. And you see it gets kind of messy. Um, there are a lot of cables there uh, that connect to the USB hubs. Um, and they are a little hidden actually. Uh, let me use my mouse to point to it. It's here in the backside as in USB hub. Um, and yeah, so there are a lot of cables connecting to USB. There are some buses like RS485 uh, that interconnect multiple places because that's what the devices on the test need. Um, sometimes power supply uh, is done or sometimes we need a, a continuous power supply so there are so this is multi socket thingy in, in the bottom there and yeah um, that's the real thing if you don't clean up regularly um, we currently have eight of these racks totaling uh, 128 slots um, that are placed in our server room in storage rooms and in the offices itself 
so they are all built to be silent and additionally we have some 10-ish labs with 4 to 16 slots on different desks that always depends on what the developers need um, because the colleagues doing graphics stack development usually want to have their camera and display on their desk um, or the colleagues doing low-level bring up uh, like bootloader porting or drive, uh, developing new drivers sometimes want to poke into a device with an oscilloscope or a multimeter and then they want to have the device on their desk but the desk slots are just integrated into the overall infrastructure so there is nothing special there um, for our interactive use case uh, all our hardware is controlled by labgrid so we use labgrid as a uh, bought or as a hardware abstraction in our lab and on top of LabGrid we use PyTest for the uh, test case development. Um, for the continuous testing and continuous integration part we mostly use Jenkins at the moment for the for building of, of images and root file systems and we are currently evaluating to move to GitLab um, just because it's a little more modern and sometimes you have to try something new um, yeah, and our developers seem to be not that happy with, with Jenkins. Um, and we then execute the test suits that are written in PyTest uh, via LabGrid on the real hardware. So nothing special there, same infrastructure. Uh, talking about LabGrid, um, if you want to have a look at what LabGrid does, take a look into the documentation, labgrid.greetthedocs.io. Um, or I've done a talk uh, at FOSTEM this year uh, about the joint tier of testing embedded devices um, where I go a little bit deeper into how you can use LabGrid to remotely control a device and how to write tests and how the infrastructure around LabGrid works. Okay, so far uh, about how infrastructure is built, what's good uh, in the way we've done it. Um, what works well is that we just have a single pool of hardware and infrastructure we use for uh, interactive use and for continuous testing. Um, in most cases, we only need a single uh, prototype from our customers, and then we can do both interactive work and continuous testing. But it's usually better to have uh, at least a spare uh, or even a second device that's already integrated into our lab um, because, um, yeah, developers sometimes forget to uh, unlock the lab grid places they've been working on and then the continuous testing can't run at night and then you've got failed tests for no good reason and so yeah it's always better to have one device that's allocated for testing and one that's for allocated for real real work this also allows us to have two colleagues work on the same problem in parallel if we really need to um, since we share a common infrastructure for continuous testing and for interactive work, everybody can uh, debug failing tests interactively on the device where they actually failed. So we you don't need to debug anything in another infrastructure than the infrastructure the tests run in. Um, and every developer can use every board or every slot in every lab, no matter if it's in a rack or if it's in your on your colleague's desk, um, it's all the same. And that makes makes uh, moving tasks between colleagues really easy or, easy or getting help from other colleagues really easy. Um, another good thing here is um, since we can never rely on the state of a device for continuous testing, um, we always provision our devices from scratch. So uh, take for example kernel CI that relies on a working pre-flashed bootloader on a device and then uses that bootloader to load the kernel and user space from that. Um, but we can't rely on a bootloader because we never know what state it is in uh, when we run to run tests. And same for interactive work, uh, we never know in which state the continuous testing may has left the board because you never know what went wrong at night unless you have looked into the results before. And so you can even use the um, uh, provisioning from scratch for the interactive use and that tends to uh, yield more deterministic results for, for your work. 
Um, another thing that turned out quite well was that our labs are built to be versatile. We do not rely on a specific connector or a specific form factor of our devices on the tests. Um, we couldn't even do that if we wanted to because our customers have their own requirements and have to fulfill those. So we are kind of a second thought, an afterthought there. So yeah, our labs have to be versatile. And until now, I guess we have placed all but one hardware in a lab in one of these racks. And this one thing that didn't work out was just too bulky, too large. And so it ended up on a shelf next to a developer's desk, but it's just integrated into the lab on the developer's desk. So it's still integrated into our, into our overall board farm. Okay, what are problems in our current lab? One problem is that devices are connected with a lot of cables. Um, think about uh, the, the primer I gave. Uh, you need power supply. You need a serial port. Uh, you may have GPIOs that are connected. You need USB for serial download of new images. You have Ethernet. You have NSD card. You have uh, graphics connections and so on. And I'll just stop because I'll run out of fingers shortly. Uh, so you see there's a lot of connections going to a single device on the test in the lab. And that tends to be uh, a problem. Uh, two, two things here. One is um, if you're just working on an adjacent slot in the lab, or the one above or two down or something like that, you sometimes uh, disconnect things on another slot without recognizing. For example, if you're just connecting or reconnecting a new USB port, you may um, 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 move another USB connection and that's not that stable, for example. Um, and moving a device to another lab is ever prone because you have to carefully note down all the connections you disconnect then take it to another lab and reconnect it there. And that tends to take longer than you would imagine to, until it's really running again. Um, another set of infrastructure, uh, another set of problem is that part of our infrastructure are black boxes. Um, for example, the serial servers. We had a case where we had serial servers that were missing um, characters. So just um, you toggle the RTS line uh, somewhere in the transition between the bootloader and the kernel, this happens. And even with flow control off, some characters after this toggling of the RTS line are missing. Um, that was mitigated by a firmware fix sometime later. Um, we have had power switches in the past that do not support IPv6, so it's always kind of a special case in our lab. We're having IPv4 in our lab net there, so that's not a real problem, but our IT guys would really uh, like IPv6 everywhere. Uh, we had power switches that were just not responding to our commands, like they're uh, responding to pings, and they're responding to our API calls for switching, but not doing the real switching, so someone has to go there and replug the power switch. Um, we've just swap that part uh, with another one with a spare and then it worked again. So these are our problems that are solvable but are not nice. Um, we have we have a workaround for, for every problem of this class but yeah as I said they are not nice and we do not have control over these devices. Um, these have been problems and now expensive problems. USB. Um, I mean, uh, USB is easy to use and it's widely available. Um, you can find like a lot of USB devices that solve problems for you. Just, just a few out of our lab. Let's say from, from top left beginning, that's an USB to CAN interface. If you need, need the CAN bus connected to a single device on the test. Um, you sometimes need a JTAG. Uh, to, for example, flash uh, a CPU or recover from some, some deep, deep failures or do debugging. Uh, logic analyzers, if you want to trace out some, some logic signals, RS-232 and UART interfaces because, well, you just need them. Um, USB SD muxes, um, if you want to be able to remotely control the content of a uh, SD card and then boot your device on the test from that. And well, a USB MUX, another device we have we have built is well basically the USB SD MUX, but for USB sticks. 
Um, so yeah, a lot of USB devices in our apps and it's just like USB is everywhere. And I can really feel Woody looking at all these USB connections. Um, I would say USB is a bad idea, but that's always easy to say in hindsight. Um, USB gives us a ton of stability issues. Um, we had to find out that a lot of USB devices have strange bugs, like USB hubs disappearing from the bus uh, at some point without uh, any noticeable problem, and re just reconnecting them brings them back. We have seen USB serial uh, uh, adapters that are still accepting uh, USB addresses, but do not respond to uh, transfer requests. Um, and all these USB problems are usually hard to debug because you're not sitting next to your board. You uh, have to remotely guess what's the actual problem on the other side. And these problems often need remote hands or somebody that's really, really physically on the lab to recover because you have to replug a USB device. Uh, and these problems tend to affect neighboring slots in the lab because when one USB hub or a part of a USB hub is gone, then well, there are just a lot of USB devices failing. And these problems really cost a lot of time and thus cost a lot of money and a lot of developers' nerves. Okay, what are potential solutions for this problem? One thing is uh, we want to get rid of a, a good amount of these black boxes in our lab, especially the power switches and the uh, serial servers uh, are usually a problem. Ethernet switches seem to be more reliable, maybe because they are built in larger quantities and are better tested. And we want to drastically reduce the size of our USB buses. So we want to have less USB devices connected to a single USB host and we want to have less um, ground connections between adjacent slots in a lab where a USB hub spans multiple slots and same for, for example, the serial connection and Ethernet. So yeah, that, that's a problem. And another thing we want to uh, address while we are there is we want to have less cables that run from the infrastructure to the device on the test. Okay, what's our idea to do that? Um, the idea now is we want to have a single test controller that serves one device on the test. And we want to build that test automation controller in a way that it serves around the 80% use case. So we do not want to cover everything we found in our, find in our labs, but at least the most part of what we find in our labs with a single device. Um, we want to build it in a way that is far more robust than the current setup um, and more reliable in that. And we, we want to build it for everyday use. So I think that mostly means uh, it has to be built in a housing and not just to be a green PCB you put somewhere and needs to have ESD protection, needs to have a software updating concept and stuff like that. Um, how does it look from the architecture side? Well, as I said, you just take uh, a test automation controller per device on the test and we built these test automation controllers around an ARM SOC. Uh, and of course, we run embedded Linux on that and all the software we need to remotely control the device on the test. And that's mostly LabGrid and the IO bus. Uh, IO bus is a CAN based bus we use for additional devices we want to attach to our test automation controller. For example, additional uh, GPIOs we need for a device on the test or analog measurements and stuff like that. Um, we connect these test automation controllers with a single single Ethernet port and we use PoE for power delivery there and connect that to the already existing PoE switches in our labs. Um, and we integrate a, a Ethernet switch into our test automation controllers so we can share the same physical cable running from the switch to the uh, uh, test automation controller to also supply our device on the test with Ethernet connectivity. We uh, add a few GPIOs to these devices because you always need a few GPIOs. Um, it has a, a logic level UART interface and a concept how you can adapt that to, for example, RS-232. 
Uh, there's a CAN bus that you can use for CAN and CAN FD connectivity to your device on the test. Uh, one CAN bus we can use for the IO bus, so extending uh, our capabilities. Um, we have integrated a power switch into our test automation controllers. Um, we use that for uh, switching off not mains voltage, but the lower voltage the device and the test actually need. Um, and we've got uh, some USB ports, uh, host ports, and a device port on our, in our architecture. How does it look like in reality? Well, we already have got some prototypes on our desk. So um, this is our test automation controller. Um, uh, the bottom board, uh, the lower board, this one here is the board with the CPU, some Noctava systems, uh, some here, um, and the Ethernet switch is integrated here and everything we need for the device under test connections. Um, those are mostly in the uh, front facing uh, side of the housing here. And the other board is the power switch. It's mostly empty PCB. It's just, well, everything you need to switch power on and off. Um, yeah. Um, what's our state with that? Um, we are currently having the first revision of the hardware on our desk. Um, but we're still actively developing software. So, uh, everything we need in our, uh, in our, um, operating system to actually get it working. Um, we are planning to validate our concept and our devices on the test. Um, this fall after software development, obviously, and we really want to use these devices to replace infrastructure in our, in our labs, in our racks, uh, there. And then we'll see, um, if our concept works out or, well, what new problems we have bought by just changing so large quantities, so much, so large parts of our system. Yeah. And I guess that's, that's where we are currently. Um, thank you for, for having me and now uh, I guess we'll switch to the interactive part with uh, a room for questions and hopefully for discussions. I would really like to know uh, what your experiences with board farming are, what you've tried uh, and where you had problems and what you've tried and what worked out quite well. So yeah, see you in the discussion.